On this episode of Wine Talks, it's actually rather emotional for me. Probably the most profound conversation I've ever had with anybody in the wine industry after 300 plus episodes on the podcast, as well as 35 years of selling and tasting wine. And that's because May Elian Langsong, she's 98 years old on this show. I was honored and privileged to have her on the show because these stories and this history and how it impacts the wine world can never be told again, and they'll never repeat themselves. I met May Elian Langsong in 1993 on a trip to Bordeaux. We went to Van Expo, and our host, Mr. Henri Van der Voort, said, let's go across the street and have dinner with the Countess. The Countess was May Elian Langsong, and her winery was Pichon Lalonde, uh, de, contested alone. And we walked across the street, I mean, in the fabled town of Puyac. And we sat with this elegant woman at the time, probably in her 60s, wearing a white dress and having a great conversation. My father, myself, my wife, my mother, Monsieur Henri, and Madame May Alarion Langasson. It took me many years until recently for me to realize that I had had dinner with such royalty. I was young in the industry. I didn't really know what I was talking about. I'm embarrassed to even hear what I talked about, but we did. And through serendipitous means, I was able to get her on the show. And that's because you may have listened to her grandson, Arthur Lankesan, who was on the show as a representative of Marquez de Marietta, a winery in the Rioja region of Spain. But have a listen, and listen to the whole thing, because you will be inspired by a 98-year-old woman recalling her life. Cheers. And now we're going to go back from the beginning. Uh, When I was born in 1925, uh, just before the big financial crisis, mm-hmm. because what we must know, we talk about that later. It is uh, the financial dimension of the world of wine, with uh, the financial crisis. With wine, are, well, in general. Mm-hmm. We speak about the economy of winemaking later. Okay. Uh, uh, but at, as I say, I was born at that time mm-hmm. in the 20s, just after you remember that 1928 was a superb vintage. And uh, it was also the time uh, where uh, business went very well. It's uh, all the, the time of Art Deco, Art Nouveau. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the, the financial crisis of, of uh, 20, 1929 came. You remember mm-hmm. this financial mm-hmm. crisis? Mm-hmm. In France as well. So that's the time where I was born. At the time where everything went so well, the 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, then all of a sudden, the drama happened in 29. And from that time, uh, the world of wine went through a very dif- difficult time because the vintages in 1930 were due to bad condition mm-hmm. of weather between 30 and 35 uh, and 38. Uh, all our wines were scored between zero and five on 20. I write it in my book. I made a study. During 15 years, the wine was a catastrophe. So you see, after the rich time of the 27, 28, but um, were the top of the fashionable wines, there was 15 years of cries then, then the war happened in 1940. 
Mm-hmm. And there again, the wide world catastrophe in 40, 41, 42, 42. If you want to see the scores, I can give you the scores. But they were mentioned zero out of 20 or two out of 20, three wow. out of 20. How can you expect to sell wine when you have 0.3 three out of 20? So uh, the, uh, all, all, the board, all the board of wines and vineyards and chateaus couldn't sell. Uh, and then the war break, broke out. Mm-hmm. And that, so that was my childhood. That's why I'm coming back to my childhood. I was educated at that time of this big financial crisis where mm-hmm. everybody was so poor. The owners of Chateau, we had lots of Chateau. Uh, we will talk about that later. But uh, all my family has always been involved in winemaking. We go back, our family, the Miai family, I belong to the Miai family. We, since in our archives, since 1800, we were in the wine business as courtier first, as owner after. But what is funny is that we were only in the Medoc. We never went to Pomerol, we never went to Saint Emilion, we never went to the Grave, we never went to Sauterne. We remain, well, as we say in French, Medocain, pure Medocain. But we were everywhere in the Medoc. We were in Margot, mm-hmm. we were in we, Chateau Siron, Chateau Dozac, we were uh, in, we, in Palmer, but, uh, so Cru Bourgeois and Grand Cru Classé. Then uh, we were talking with my grandson Arthur a while ago of Marquis de Terme. We were owner of Marquis de Terme in Margot also. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Duc Cru Bocayou, my grandparents in Saint Julien, my grandparents. Uh, then, say, no? then my parents in Pichon, where I grew up. And then we go on uh, with uh, Citron, Chateau Citron, Cru Bourgeois. And then Couffron and Ver- Verdignon, my uncle in wow. saint seren cadourn still in the family. So you see, we, we cover, if you take the road from Bordeaux to, to, to the Bas Médoc, we were situated all along the, the road, meaning that we we had different soils because, of course, uh, the different appellations uh, showed the different soils, more gravel, less gravel. Uh, but we had the experience, and we could run all those chateaus together. Uh, and I grew up. That's the way I grew up. So I say that again. I grew up. All along the road of Ma, of the uh, D2, the D2, and uh, and during all the difficult time up to 1945. So it's, my education was all on wine too. Of course, we were many children, brothers, sisters, nephews, I mean cousins, but not all of them were interested in wine. In my family. My sister was not interested in wine. Mm. My brother either. I was the only little girl who was running through the vineyard day and night. I was always picking the grapes at vintage time. I was milking the cows in the morning. I was I was everywhere because I loved it. It was a pleasure. And that is why uh, now again, I created this vineyard in South Africa. We'll talk about it later. Mm-hmm. But it's li- linked, it's linked to this interest about what we'll, we'll talk about it again, the mystery of winemaking. This link that we have with the soil, in which means that we are in the hands of God because God sends send the weather uh, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be horrible. And all depends when the weather uh, goes, because it, we, have, we are very fragile in the spring, when 
in the summer mm -hmm. and in the fall. So uh, it makes our life uh, terribly interesting, never secure, in total risk, a challenge, a real challenge. And to win the challenge is not making good wines, but making great wines. Everybody can make good wines. I mean, if you are not totally stupid, you should be <laughs> able to make good wines. But if, if you want to get the, the more complex wine, the more elegant wine, all this mystery that hides in a grape and in winemaking, because there are two parts in the wine, the part considered through the soil and what happened in the vineyard, how to take care of your vineyard. And then after it is what happens in the cellars. And that is the big mystery of, uh, of winemaking. And we, we will talk about that again. When I took over Pichon, you, one of your questions was, why did you go back to university? Mm -hmm. Well, I, if I am the boss of Bichon, I cannot pretend to run a vineyard like Pichon if I know less than the people I work with. Mm -hmm. So if you have to know as, as much as the wine, as the people in the vineyard, you've got to go back to agriculture. If you want, to know, to know how to, uh, how we say, vinify, uh, to uh, make your wine uh, to, in the cellar, you have to know what's going on chemically, all the secrets. As I was telling you, not to do a good one, but to make a great wine mm -hmm. and to be better than everybody else. And it's all about proper choices at the proper time. It's understanding the, the soil, understanding the wine, understanding the grape. It makes it, makes it uh, a wonderful deal. That's why I'm still busy making wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I still have to learn more. It and never you, ends. You know, and you know, you know how old I am now. Well, I don't I'm ask 90. that question, so. Yeah, no, I, I have nothing to hide <laughs> or the proud because if I'm so old and still in, in rather good health, because I've been starting drinking wine, I should not say that because mm -hmm. it's not considered like. It's okay on this show. <laughs> don't, don't say it to anyone. I started drinking wine. I was four. So wow. don't say that wine is, ba is bad for the health. No. Because look at me, I'm going to be 99 years old. Wow. It's an old age. Mm. And I started drinking wine when I, we go back to my childhood when I was four. Of course, not pure wine. It was wine in water, mm -hmm. wine with, with, uh, with fruit. I don't know if you, if when you were in the Midoc, you were given to eat peach au vin, peach in wine. Yes, I believe we did. You remember? You I cut your peaches, that. Yes. Wow. you had sugar and wine. I started at four because my grandfather said that makes people strong. <laughs> yeah, well, so it works. Should... <laughs> Today, you should make peach au vin. Okay. Uh, but it really shows that uh, wine is very good for the health, of course, reasonably. So that's what's very interesting is to think that wine exists since century. Mm -hmm. It is in the center of the Bible. It is in the center of all the religion in Egypt. If you go to Egypt, you see all the graves painted on the tombs. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 wine started in the mid in the Middle East. They're and saying still... that Georgia, Armenia, you know, parts of the Caucasus. Mm -hmm. They're saying it in Georgia. They just did a whole show in Georgia that the, it was the beginning of wine. 
the country. George? George. And we do George. that, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Armenia. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I I consider wine. Uh, we are working in wine, you and I. It's the most beautiful job you can ever have in your for, for a lifetime. Because it goes back to to the Bible, to the start of mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there. It brings people together, and that's the great thing about wine. Look, it brings us together today, you and I, uh, after so many years. And it brings so many people together. Uh, that's a great point. It, it brings us close to God, as we were seeing about the Bible. It brings us close to the soil. And one thing I would like to point out, and I think it's very important, it comes, vineyards come from poor soil. And what is beautiful is to think that poorer the soil is, greater the wine is. And that is a mystery. From poor things, you can did mysterious things like wine. And wine, also, I wanted to point out, is interesting because uh, is it, if, if it's well done, it must be great when young, uh, wine must be well balanced young, well balanced in, in aging, and well balanced when it's very, very old. Still, when you pull out the cork of an old wine, of course, it's very different from a young wine, mm -hmm. but it still has all this mysterious gift to it. So, uh, we are very, very lucky people. So now, going back to my your childhood, uh, I grew up in these places until the war broke out. And that was your question. What happened during the war? Of course, we were occupied by the German army. I was 15 years old when the war broke out. Or well, 13, 15. Um, the German were there in a few days time. They crossed all the country of France. The, all our men were gone, they were at war. So we had no men to help us. It was only wife, women and children and old people. We were in Siron. We were all uh, around my grandparents, surrounded with all our cousin refugees, because they all had come to Bordeaux, left the north, left Paris, left the north of France, left the east of France, Alsace and Lorraine. They were. We had cousins from Verdun. I must say, we never laughed as much because we were a bunch of children. We knew that was, war was serious and a drama. But if you put lots of children together uh, with all our grandparents, we listened to their stories and they were allowing us to laugh and have fun with them. It was a jolly time with all those kids. Mm -hmm. But of course, we were working a lot, working in the fields, working in our studies. We couldn't go to school anymore. So my grandfather was teaching us French and Latin and philosophy. My mother taught us English, Spanish. A, a friend, Colonel, uh, taught us German, history, geography. And, and we were having school, all of us having class all the time. But at the same time, we worked in the vegetable garden because we had to eat. The big problem was to eat. There was no food. So the, the food was very poor, of course. And that brings me to the arrival of the Germans in Margot their occupation of Chateau Palmer. And in Chateau Palmer, we were hiding two Jewish families with their three children. 
what could we do with those Jewish friends? They were coming from Trieste. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. Um, uh, was uh, a negotiant in Trieste. And when he saw that the things were getting dangerous for the Jews in Italy, he came to, to us, said to my father, Edward, things are getting dangerous for Jewish people in Italy. Can we come and stay with you until things get better? I said, of course. Uh, no one is staying in Palmer. You're welcome. To stay. So we put them up in Palmer, the two families, the kids. And he was a great violinist. He was first violinist of the orchestra of Trieste. So before the German came, every day we were playing piano and violin in Siron with my grandparents until the Germans were there in, a, in a, a two days time. So we put up a wall between the kitchen of Palmer and another building. We walled them in and said to the children, no noise. The German way are going to be there, the other side of the wall. And now, and I was supposed to bring them food every day. Uh, the sentinel, I don't know how you say that in English, the sentinel where was greeting me. And he didn't know that I was bringing food for the Jews. But it's all written in the book of Wine and War. That's, you know that's amazing. Uh, amazing. But and, you are... And, and this went on for three months. We hid it in three months. And then when we had made all the false paper, my father was helping the resistance and he was a specialist of false paper. Uh, and he, when all the papers were done, uh, daddy, my father and my uncle Louis took them to Bayonne, the port, and they left for for Argentina, and we saved them. But every day, through wow. a small hole in the wall, I was bringing them their food. I was 15 at the time. So, if the Germans were there, as I told you, the men were at war. It was only the old ones left. Uh, the Germans took away all our horses, no horses to plow. We used cows. Who cows? They had a bad time because you had to milk them in the morning. They had to work in the field all day and milk them, milk them again wow. at night. So uh, when we say that we gave the Legion of Honor to people, we should have given Legion of Honor to all the cows. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. So no food. We were working to, in, the, in the, the fields to put food in. No horses, uh, no, no product to take care, no bottles for the wine. Very difficult to buy bottles uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. And the, the bottles I have of that time are not dark, they're white, transparent. That we, we were not able to find dark ones. Hmm. So, um, we spoke about the war. Uh, what a Pichon, a Pichon, there's a quote in the book about the 250 soldiers coming yeah. in to Pichon and that you hid the wine in the kitchen. Pichon, Pichon, the house was totally devastated by the German troops. Wow. Pichon was devastated. And you so hid the dirty. wine. So, hmm? You hid the wine behind the wall in the kitchen or behind the armoire, it says. That was in Palmer. Oh, and that, was that was in Palmer. It sounded uh, like the German. It sounded like the German lieutenant or captain was a was a cordial man that he didn't want to touch or drink uh, through your 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 wine cellar. I read that in the book. So you were fifteen then, and no, I, passed, I I passed my baccalaureate degree during the bombing. All, wow. the, all the nights of full moon, uh, with the full moon, you can see everything. So my father was saying, 
We have a full moon. We are going to be bombed. Prepare your candle. Prepare your books. Prepare your nightgown because we are going to be bombed. So, of course, uh, we could hear the alarm at 11, 11 at night. We go down to the cellar where all our beautiful old bottles were. And we waited until the morning to get out and preparing our exams in that condition of life. Yeah. I passed my baccalaureate degree in 1943. Wow, during, right during the, the war. Okay. Right, yeah, right in the middle. So then, after the war, after the war, uh, I got married with an army man. And this army man had landed in Utah Beach and wounded in Utah Beach. He was uh, in, the, uh, in the French army, the, what do you call it, the French uh, resistance army with General Leclerc. Leclerc de Haute Clock, and the, it was the second armor division, and they had joined the Patton Division in England. So he landed with the Patton Division. Wow. Wow. In Utah Beach wow, wow. In August. He was wounded, and then, uh, well, delivered France, Alsace Lorraine, went to Vietnam. Immediately at, after France was, was free, he went off to Vietnam. From 1945 to 1947, wounded, he was wounded in Alsace, second time, wounded in Hanoi, in Vietnam, <laughs> in 47. Then I met him, we got married, and life took us, as you know, twice to the United States. First time, it was in 1951, during the Korean War. You remember? Mm -hmm. The Korean War in, in 1951. And you were in uh, Kansas. We were in Kansas, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and he was studying at the Command and General Staff College in Fort Leavenworth. So, as you know, there is a big prison in Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. So everybody laughed when they said we were going to be stationed in Leavenworth. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to the prison? They say, no, the army school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was great. We were quite young at the time. We had two babies. We took our two babies with us. And at that time, I decided, because I, I was very impressed by the American army. And to know your country better and understand how your country was so strong, I thought I'm, I'm not going to, to discover uh, the qualities of the American by just going to the cocktail party at the mess on the Friday night. So I must join the army, the army life. So what I did, I signed up to be a nurse, an wow. army nurse. I passed my exam. They, they, they took me in very kindly. And I joined the, the army hospital. And I'm very proud of that. I have pictures in my uniform uh, as nurse, army nurse, yeah. Amazing. So I learned how you were organized, uh, how uh, uh, really how you face uh, happiness, uh, how you uh, face mm -hmm. sufferance, uh, when you uh, how you prepare the sick people for surgery, uh, the way the American uh, uh, were so well organized. I love my time uh, uh, this time in, in Kansas. So this that was 1951. Two times. 51. And then we went back 
to the to to the to, the, to Kansas in sixty eight. My husband was assigned on the staff. He, uh, the Americans are so great that they open the school, as, as, uh, they open the st uh, staff school to foreigners. There was one French, one Japanese, one German, mm. one English. Mm. Five, no, four officers were foreigners and they were treated like American officers. They were allowed to all the secrets, just, they were just a few secrets that the foreigners were not supposed to know. But away from that, we were considered like American. The, the, the American uh, spirit is such, so open, uh, so confident, in their allied allied troops, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we spent again two years there, and um, my husband was also a pilot. He was given wow. his personal plane. He could use his plane. There were horses in it on the boat. He had his own horse. Wow. Um, it, uh, we were beautifully treated. By that time, the second time, we had four children. So that was quite difficult because the kids had to do their in American education in American school, but also their French education when they came home. So the kids had a lot of work, but they loved it. Have you been to Kansas sometime? Only Kansas City to sell computers a long time ago, 1982 or something like that. You've got to go to the Army Post. I'd like to do that now. We have beautiful trees. Unfortunately, I went back later and they had cut down most of the trees. Oh, I'm sorry. There's probably, well, probably a reason for that, a reason for that. So, uh, so then that's about the Army. And that takes us back to... Uh, further on on my life, when in 1978, uh, uh, I took over, my, 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 my husband retired as general in 1971. Wow, he's a, he got the general, that's amazing. Yeah, and, uh, and in 1978, I was asked by my family to take over Pichon. So that's the time when I had to go back to university to study uh -huh. economics. <laughs> because what I had learned as a kid had nothing to do with the scientific way things were going on in 1978. Uh, my professor was uh, 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 son prénom? Pascal Ribeiro Gaillon. He's one of the very great scientific about wine. Uh, and uh, so I followed his courses and he be became the consultant of Pichon. Wow. So there, uh, the first thing I had to do is to invest because things were poor at that time in Pichon. It was the time when everybody was starting to invest a lot in vineyards. And now the invest, investment you can see in the sellers, in the, all the machinery is tremendous. That was unusual for a woman to run a winery, I would suspect, in 1973. I was the only one because at that time in Mouton Rothschild, you had only Philippe. It was mm -hmm. Philippe who was running Mouton. Uh, it was not, not, uh, uh, Philippine. Yeah? Philippine. it was not Philippine yet. By the way, you know that Muto Rothschild uh, showed their bo new bottle, your new label yesterday. Yeah, I saw that. And you saw how it is? They say it's, it's a red pink flower. 
There was a big ceremony. My friends were at that ceremony two days ago, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Philippine was not there, so I was with, with Philip. And Corinne was, Menzelopoulos was not there yet. It was her father. There were no, I was the only woman in all of the Medoc. Wow. You, you, and you were... they were laughing up at me, saying a, wo a woman cannot be successful in winemaking. That was not very kind. No. <laughs> so I decided that I would show them that they were totally mistaken on that point. And the curious thing was that as I was new in, in, the, in the middle, I knew again, often I wanted to hear about uh, what was going on in the vineyard. And I was wanting to know what they thought about it. And I was asking a question, hoping they would give me, comment dire, conseil, advice. an advice. And curiously, believe it or not, Paul, if I, I, I asked a question to four gentlemen, the four answers were so different. I was saying, they're all lying to me. Now I must guess, who is lying the most and who is lying the least? <laughs> That's hard work. <laughs> but you know, women, they try to understand what's going on. So I knew they were lying anyway. So, <laughs> well, it's the first paragraph of your book. And uh, since my French is a little slow, but your preface says, that the the industry was dominated by men forever. And you go back to Jesus uh, who turned water to wine and uh, blood. And so it must've been very important to you that, that we, uh, that we, you understood in your book, that people understood that, that wine and women, actually that should be a new book. Wine and women is, was a difficult um, situation back then. It still is. It's still a very popular conversation to have. But now, nowadays, I think women are everywhere. Now they're really equal. Uh, they're not left at home all the time. All the, world, all the girls have a job. Now, now we are used to it. So you started running the winery. You took over the reins, made the investment. Investment, worked on the quality. As I told you, I didn't want to do a good wine. I wanted to do a great wine. So that was my, uh, the secret of my life it was to try and understand the mystery in the fields. I was all the time in the vineyards, uh, uh, seeing how it was pruned. Uh, well, one thing I didn't tell you is but you know, you know that well. Uh, the great things of the Medoc is that we make wine by blending the wine. The difference with Burgundy, of course. Uh, and the blending is, is another mystery. What, how much are you going to put on Merlot in proportion to, to, to the Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, to... Uh, to the Cabernet Franc. And one of our secrets in, in Pichon was our 8% of Petit Verdot. We are the only one in the wow. middle. It was really the, all my family, the Miai family was successful because they were lovers of Petit Verdot and they knew how to handle Petit Verdot. Petit Verdot is a not a little grape. It's a very <laughs> tiny little way, difficult to grow, difficult mm -hmm. to mature. And if you don't do it well, it's, it's, it's bad. And too many people give it up because it was bad. But it was only that they, they did not have the know-how. Arpetit Verdot was not bad. It was good. It was even very, very good. 8% was enormous. Then... Major uh, 
Uh, wine, I think it's The the 1970s were difficult for Bordeaux, were they not? The vintages, um, ec economy, uh, world acceptance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the we had a lovely 70. We did a very, very lovely 71. 71 was a difficult, very difficult uh, vintage to succeed. We made a very tiny, tiny quantity. Uh, but if you if you come ahead of 71, uh, you will see it's very elegant. It's a charming, charming vintage. So 72, 73, 74, four, forget them. Then came the 75, was great, but so many people missed the 75 in Midok because they overpowered the tenants. They made, they wanted to extract. It was so uh, good, lovely, lovely grapes. So they extract too much tannin. And uh, it was a de deceiving vintage in aging. 76 was lovely, very elegant. Small quantity, 77, forget it. Then I came with 78, very difficult vintage, but we did one of the, well, the best 78 of all the Medog. It was considered like even better than the first rose, 78. Then 79 was uh, easy vintage. Uh, we did a great quantity, enormous quantity. We did. We did not have enough vats. Had had to to rent vats. We didn't have enough vats. It was my second year in Pichon. I'm wow. not invested yet, so we we are lacking, and I had to put my vats outside next to the vineyard of Chateau Latour. I asked permission to Latour to put That's my right vats in their in their uh, their uh, on the chemin on the road. And their road. So the vats were in the Latour's road. Okay. Well. <laughs> so we made a win of 79. And that was the start of Pichon. Yeah. Then 80, I remember. Very, very lovely. 82. So I was wondering if you knew this book I wrote about the 82 vintage. I have it here. I don't know the book. Look. Can you see it? Yes. And that's just about the 1982 vintage? Yeah. Wow. Well, Monsieur Lancanzong, you're going to have to send me a copy. I'll have to find one on eBay somewhere. Magic wine. It's called magic wine. So it's, it's lovely because it's a story of, it's a book. Beautiful. It's very, it's like the Petit Prince of Saint-Exupéry. It's uh, en français, uh, je suppose. No, en anglais. Oh, wow. Then I can read it, at least you, <laughs> quickly. You want, anyway. to, yeah. you want me to send you one? I would love to have a copy of that, but it's not okay. that I'm sure I could find one. I do have this copy. Yeah, that, that's of, the new book. Because yeah. of uh, so, Madame, Madame so Maria Povetna. You know who has the cover, made the cover on the book? I think your oh, grandson book. did this. And his grandson... His name is Arthur. Yes. <laughs> it's and beautiful. Did you, did you see the four grapes on the top of the vine? I do. Those are the four children. Oh, very cute. Let me see if I can put this up here. There these, you are, yeah. You have four grapes. Yeah, That's these grapes. That's work. It's very pretty. Yeah? I love I mean, it. I'm looking forward to finishing it, though. Uh, the, my French reading French is difficult for me, but I, I, I it's no, my, it's, it, is, it's a, it is totally translated into English. It's done. Now I must go to South Africa to have it printed. I don't want to read it in English. I want to read it in French. That's it's like a textbook for me. It helps me, <laughs> it helps me learn my French. You know, my father spoke French, and so I set out to learn French. So, so you. You wrote in a book, or there was a quote in one of the books of your history, and when you, um, when the estate had to be broken up amongst your siblings, yeah, and different people got different things, and that's always a difficult thing to do in a family. But you ended up selling Pichon. Um, 
you change of life, change of ideas, uh, wanted to, I, what, what was behind all that? What is the question? What, when you sold Pichon, what did you do? Well, I had hope that my children would take over. But when I took over myself, it was late in my life, and already late in my children's life, they all had studied other uh, subjects, and none of them had studied viticulture. None of them had studied analogy. They were all living in Paris, and they were not interested in vineyards, not wow. at all. So I thought they might change their mind. I asked them to come uh, to work with me and try, and they did, the four of them, but they all decided they, went, they wanted to go back to Paris. So some of them had said, well, give us Pichon, and we will manage Pichon from Paris. I said, no, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. If you are uh, uh, close to your, uh, if you are a real, how you say, viticulteur, you have to live with your vineyard, with, not out. Mm -hmm. You don't understand what's going on when you, when you are in Paris. You have to see the weather every day. So, I like that live life, with it. But I decided I can't carry more, carry on, and I don't want that after my death, the distress, financial reasons of, uh, about running Pichon badly, better give it up. Wow. I made a choice. Yeah. But by that time, uh, remember when I was in Pichon, I had invested in a cru bourgeois called Chateau Bernadotte. Because I wanted, what I like in wine is not to make one great wine like Pichon, uh, classified growth. What I like is to deal with all kinds of wines, through bourgeois, simple wines, uh, all, all the different kinds of wines, not only a classified gold. So I had added to Pichon, Bernadotte. was a very big success. It was a lovely, lovely property. But there again, I sold it at the same time as Pichon. But I also, when I was in Pichon, had bought uh, our vineyard in Glen Ely. Mm -hmm. It's Pichon who bought Glen Ely. That it was only for the reason that I wanted to have a foreign vineyard. I had, I had tried to invest in the United States. Uh, I uh, in, tried to invest uh, near New York, in Long Island. Really? Yeah, yeah, I said, I was, I started making vintages in Long Island with a friend of mine called the Hargrave. But I understood that there was no aging possible mm. in this kind of soil because the grapes, uh, the, the roots go to the water and uh, there's, the water level is very close mm -hmm. and the wines die when they, you, you cannot age a vineyard there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went to another place. I started making wine at Chateau Saint-Michel in Seattle. Really? In Washington? Yeah, in Washington State. I worked four years in making our, our blends. But we, we were close to sign the agreement with Chateau Saint-Michel. The wine was made, everything was made. But you, you know perhaps that Chateau Saint-Michel belongs to the tobacco company. Yes. It's a, it's a big tobacco company. That's a big thing, yes. And, and they wanted to put in the, in the deal that I was obliged in the deal with them to do so many, so many bottles a year. And I said, I cannot sign that. 
ma making wine is not making a car in a factory. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with the weather condition. And if the, the wine are not good, I cannot bottle every year the same number of bottles. So the deal broke. Wow. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big, big place. That's what they're, they're all about marketing, not, you know, the wine isn't secondary to that. But so at the same time you were in South Africa as well, or that was after St. Michel? So I went to South, so to South Africa because I broke the deal with, with Seattle. And, and how? And my, my, my how, heart was broken when I, when I gave up the deal with St. Michel. I love, I love their mentality. I love the work. We worked four years together wow. making our wine. Yeah. I'm sorry that that happened. They were, they were delightful people. Delightful people. And so Glen so, Ellie, is that much different than, <laughs> than yeah. America? You know, South Africa is so different. I just found it fascinating. You ended up in South Africa as a place to I, continue. I ended because for, for three reasons. First reason, the quality of the soil. Uh, as you know, perhaps, at that time, I was president of the Inter International Wine and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I read that. Standard. Yes, a spirit, a spirit competition. Yes, and every year uh, after blind tastings, we were del deliver delivering trophy, and many times the trophy of the best blended wine, because I had created the trophy for blended wines with. It had to be at least three different kinds of grapes. And uh, many times this trophy was won by South African people. Mm. So they were given a beautiful trophy, a piece of art, and an invitation to come in Pichon at vintage time so that we could exchange our knowledge. They and us. So I started having lots of South African friends who invited me to South Africa to see their vineyard, and I invited them to Pichon for them to see how we worked. So I knew South Africa wines very mm -hmm. well when I, they made this decision. That's my answer number one. Number two was I had read a book that you have perhaps read. If you have not read it, you should buy it. You can still find it. It's written in 1822 by the name of, uh, uh, just, I, I'm, I'm getting tired. Um, yeah, it's, been, uh, it's uh, already been an hour, so. Okay. Topolosino. Yeah, I'm trying to find where it's Topolosino of, of the best soils in the world. It's a study of the best terroir in all the world. Wow. It's written by a man by the name of André Julien. And Julien with two L's. Julien. J-U-L-L-I-E-N. André Julien. 1822. Well, he, his first copy was in 1818. But he has many, many editions. You can still find it. Yeah, I'm going to look for it. Interesting. And, and he makes a study of the best. And at that time, he made a classification of the terroir of South Africa in parallel of the terroir of the Medoc. Imagine. That's and the terroir of Ganeli, and the terroir of Ganeli is stated as great as all the second growth of Bordeaux. They're gorgeous wines. Yeah. We had, so we had Leah. The second reason, the terroir. Then there's another reason. It was, no, it's four reasons. Third reason, it is in honor of the Huguenots. You know the story of South Africa. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Dutch were having a colony in South Africa, and they wanted to make wine for the boats who were heading to the Far East. And they needed people who knew how to make wine. At that time, the French Protestant people were kicked out of France because of their religion. And they went to South Africa, and they are the ones who started the vineyards in South Africa, the French Huguenots. I read that somewhere. I'm glad you reminded yeah, me. You must read that. Their yeah. story is, is magnificent. So uh, I thought, well, it's nice for me to go back to those French people who started the vineyard there. It's a lovely story. Mm-hmm. But then the first point was my friend, Dr. Anton Rupert. He is this very uh, rich South African man that is at the head of, uh, comment t'appelle? Richmond. The Rich, Richmond Company. Mm-hmm. Richmond Company. And he told me he was a friend of, of Mandela. Oh, wow. And he, he told me, May, you must come to South Africa to help the economy of this country to pull up after wow. what happened and help the wines to be great, help to give salaries to people. So I said, no, I'm too old. I was 75 by that time. <laughs> I said, uh, I'm not at this old age going to start uh, a vineyard, planting what planting vines at 70 years old. Wow. Crazy. I'm not that crazy. So well. I said, no, no, no. And then finally it took, it took me in. And I did it. C'est fou, huh? C'est fou, c'est fou. <laughs> um, so we created a school. We created a restaurant. I created a, a, a museum of glasses for the economy to work. It's That's no very use kind. speaking. You got to work. Yeah. There we are. You know, this is... But a, you are um, when, when are you going to come and visit us? Well, it's, it certainly is part of uh, my next group of wine travels. Um, next year, we're going to Monaco for the Grand Prix. We'll, we're going to swing through Bordeaux. My friends want to see Bordeaux. I just tasted the latest vintage of Pichon at the wine tasting last uh, two weeks ago in Beverly Hills. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, and I would love to see Glenelli. I had a wonderful conversation with Leah Pavetta in the in the office. Wait, and- yes. In the so you know, the it's in the hands of Nicholas, my other grandson. Well, because the other one went to Spain, so you can't use him. He's he's doing stuff in Rioja. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, the one in, in Spain is Arthur. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I would love Arthur. to visit. I would love to visit. I would love to see you on property there. I'm leaving on February 12th. Back I'm to... Leaving- I'm leaving on, you know, for the for the vintage, for the coming vintage, 24. Back to South Ooh. Africa. Why don't you come and see us? I think that we're going to figure that out. I would love to do that. That'd be really don't special. Don't wait too long. Don't wait too long because I, no. I will not be there anymore. No, I'm not going to wait. I don't wait. That's not my style. Mm-hmm. I said, I don't, I don't wait. That's not my style. I don't wait. I don't wait. I don't, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I want I, I know you're tired and I want to wrap this up, but I, I wanted to tell a story about Henry Henri. Uh he was trying to sell me some wine, uh Li Pu Yi. I don't know if you remember that. It was his Chinese restaurant wine that he had made at Burkut. And um I was a young kid. I did you know, I did business, and uh, he finally called my father. And in French, he says, you know, your son won't return my calls. <laughs> and he taught me the lesson that in mm-hmm. business, the courtesy of a return, the, the courtesy of a return call is so important in, in business. And, and I learned that lesson in 19, I don't know, it was probably around when I met you in 1993 in that, at that time frame. 
Uh, he was a great man. I didn't know either that he was part of the resistance. Was he part of the French army? I think he was in the American army as well. He, he, was, he, was, he was in the American army. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. He became an American, yeah. So um, I want to thank you for this time. It's been enchanting, charming. Uh, it's been an honor. And you will see us in South Africa at Glen Ellie. Thank you. And uh, when, when I have, I, I used to go a lot to the United States, you know, it was my, the market I liked the best when I was running Pichon. I was all the time in the United States. No plans in the near future, I suppose. Now, no, now I don't travel anymore. Uh, only uh, the easiest way from home to home. Uh, from Switzerland uh, to Glen Ellie, but I don't even go to Paris anymore, no, not to London. But you can, if I can't travel, you can travel. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah, so we fly into Stellenbosch, or where do we fly to? To Cape Town. Cape Town, okay. I'm going to make that arrangement, and I will communicate with Arthur as well on this. But it's been such an honor. It's been such an honor to hear your story. Well, it, it was very kind of you uh, to... But did you want to ask me some questions that I didn't, I didn't think of? No, I think you, 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 you studied my list here, and it's, that's perfectly fine. I think an hour is enough time. Yeah. And maybe, uh, maybe that's the reason I come to, to South Africa and we sit down and do it again. Whatever. I think that'd be... <laughs> well, we don't do it again. You come. And I'm there going we to are. come. I'm going to come and we're going to do it live. It is, a it is a beautiful country. I told you that the soil was lovely, but the climate is lovely. And the people are charming. So well-educated. So think, nice. It's an, it seems like a natural progression for you, uh, given the reasons that you went there. Uh, and the request from such an important person to to be there, yeah. that you're able to do that. And at 75, I mean, that's... But uh, the best time for you to come is between January and April. Because it can get very, very hot later on. You think, do you think that this ambition you have... I do have a question because you said something very important in the beginning and I wrote it down because I try to define this link between humanity and wine. And yeah. I think you made the link, which is God, because yeah. you could you could study all you want. You you might even study the molecular transfer of of nutrients at the at the you know taproot level. It's not going to give you the answer as to why uh, it would bring us together, you know, 30 years later. And I think that's a really important feature. And, and I think that's also the reason why in 1970 at 75 years old, you couldn't walk away from it. You had to continue to do something in our industry. I'll never retire. Uh, I, I love doing what I'm doing now, but I stopped selling wine on a daily basis. But I'm not, I, I can't leave. It's in but your soul. Well, uh, what so many people tell me now, even my family, why do you go on working? It's ridiculous. Stop, stop. <laughs> But my answer is simple. God has given us life. As long as we can serve people, because there are so many miserable people, they need our work, they need salary. Mm -hmm. So we have to give back the fact that we are still alive. So until the end, I will go on working to make people happy, to give them salaries, because what is important is to create every day, to create every day, create work, create money, pleasure, by making good wines again, create. And you're not supposed to stop if you still can go on. So and when I have to stop, I'll stop. That is so uh, humbling. Because I fight on this podcast, I fight corporate America 
and all the wines that are on the shelves that that don't have this history, that don't tell this story. You're telling the story. The you know, wine is a humble product. Yeah. And it's meant for pleasure and it's meant for family. It's meant to gather and it's meant to discuss and think. And I, I and fight. And it comes from poor soil. It comes from poor soil. And it comes from poor soil. What an amazing concept that is. To make us happy. Yes, to make us happy. I hope I can that's, quote that's you. What... C'est fou. I, mm-hmm. I, hope, I hope that I can be as articulate as you are as I continue doing this work to share these stories and to share the concept of wine as not an alcoholic beverage, but as a, a, a but binding well, agent for humanity. If, if you look at the world today, with all the wars, all the uh, violence, it's all because people have forgotten that God exists. If they ha- remember that God exists and that you must make everybody happy, there would be no wars. It's just, just you're right. They have forgotten the principle. It's a pretty simple solution, really. Yeah, yeah. But humanity, and we have to go back to those simple, it's a simple knowledge. And wine is it. And drink wine and drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to to visiting, and I look forward to. To feeling, I want to feel the Glenelli wines on property. That's really what it's about, you know. The understanding uh, the spirit of the wine uh, for coming from you and the people that work there, and the salaries you've created, and the and the and the family you've created down there. Which is, I mean, how noble is that? You, your 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 entire family, going back to when you started the family tree. I embarrassed Arthur when we podcasted because I downloaded the family tree so I could understand you know, where everybody was coming from. And, you know, you're going back to the 1800s, doing the same thing. And that's keeping people together. 1780 something, yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. We could do this forever. And and, 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 and fortunately, and that only Arthur directly involved. But I have two more. Maxime. That has been living in China. He also worked with us, was selling our wine in China, and wow. he and he also worked in Denali. And there's another little girl called Cecilia. You perhaps will hear from her. And she's she in? Lives in London. Ah. And she loves she loves uh, Denali. She follows courses tasting uh, tasting wine. She has two two babies. Soon, three babies, and she is passionate for Glenelly too. So, I hope that the, the, the next generation, their generation, will have more people, more kids interested. Because I would like them to study from the vineyard, to to study to be viticulturist. I think to they're going to come back. It seems to me, in all the interviews I've done, particularly from Europe. America is a little different because we're so invested in capital, capitalism, so to speak, in the wine industry. I mean, it's very difficult, as you know. I, I'm here in Napa right now, actually. Uh, but they always come home, I think. I think, I think you're going to see that, they, that they'll come back to their roots, as you did. And uh, no pun intended, they come back to the, the industry is too hard to ignore. There's too much history and there's too much passion. And there's too much... Uh, heart in in what you do that they can't stay in China forever you know that <laughs> well the world is in such bad condition that perhaps they will understand that they made wrong wrong choices yeah. that's why everything goes bad they would come back to better choices I agree Thank you again so much. Uh, it's been a long hour and a half or so. Arthur, I so appreciate uh, your patience with me to organize this. No, but Great pleasure, Paul. It's wonderful, this link. We're going to keep this link between you, so. Arthur, and me. I hope so. so well, you, now you we're getting have... to Christmas. Do you I'm remember... going to say Merry Christmas. 
Merry Christmas to you too. Was Chateau Belgrade was, was one last question? Was Henri's? Could you walk from Henri's place to Chateau Pichon? Could you, was, yes, was, of course. Okay, we did that, and I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't put this together until about three months ago when I read the Cladstra book that I walked because across the street. Didn't. It was around the corner. Yes, I, mean, I can't believe this. It's just amazing. You're elegant. I remember what you were wearing. You were wearing a white dress, and you were very elegant and very proper. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? If that the war had not broke out, I might have got married to Ali. Wow. He wanted uh, to get married to me. Wow. Young. That's not in the book. No. <laughs> no one knows. It yeah. was a secret between him and I. Well, we did notice a little spark, that's for sure. Ah, you noticed. <laughs> yes, we did. I remember that because we were with Alain Riviere, uh, who's with Chateau Escalon right now. And um, but he was a great man, and my father and him were good friends, and now we're friends, and I appreciate that. You see, friendship goes on forever. It does so go thank on. You, Merry Christmas you. to you. Merry Christmas to you and your family, Arthur, the same. And congratulations on your win the other day. I saw that posting of your um, martial arts there. And thank you. Well, <laughs> one last thing, perhaps, we're speaking of family. I'm expecting my 17th great-grandchild. Wow. Now that's congratulations. 17. That's amazing. That's going a to be born in March. Yeah. You congratulations. And we will see you um, after the holidays in South Africa. You're welcome. You're welcome. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Arthur. Bye, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul Callum Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.